It's been a long road for the descendants of Bobber. Their humble origins in Samarkand and eventual rise to the Peacock Throne have mostly been a series of ups and few downs. Some might call that a good thing, but sometimes when we look at the history of great people, we remember that they are exactly as we refer to them. People. People have feelings and dreams. They have ambitions. And most of all, they have expectations. These are the thoughts going through Afsin, the Mughal Padishah's head, whose coronation was overshadowed by his father's funeral. Throughout his youth, Afsin was often left aside by his father, which he understood given the immense role of being the Padishah. There was an expectation that sitting on that beautiful throne in the Red Fort would deliver a sense of accomplishment, a sense that the spotlight was finally moving. Yet it never did. It was an inconvenient truth that Afsin could never be the man his father had been, no matter his accomplishments. And the worst part of it all was his father's detachment from it all. Somehow, the fact that Timurtash, over the course of his life, created an empire to rival Darius and Alexander, but without actually caring about it all that much, was the most painful part of it all. Was Afsin jealous? Maybe. He had dreams of conquering India, but he knew that no matter what he did, the reality was that he could only claim to be completing the conquest of India. Nonetheless, he would reach for it anyway. What else is there to do, really? The first major campaign Afsin set out on was for Tamil Nadu, which was more or less the last major conquest to be had on the subcontinent. At this point, these conquests are merely a formality, given that the Mughal army is completely unstoppable. Only the men-at-arms are even necessary anymore, meaning most of the Mughal army is still sitting at home. These elite soldiers can defeat armies triple or quadruple their size. The only strange thing is why these realms don't just put down their weapons and save their lives. That's their choice, I suppose. Indeed, a battle with 24,000 enemy deaths and only 274 friendly deaths. They say that Afsin asked the record keepers to exaggerate the numbers to inflate his ego, but those rumors are, as of yet, unproven. When he conquered the Chola Kingdom, Afsin thought about who should get the land, and he remembered his father's handing out of land and how unfair it felt to be given some random backwater in Burma. He split the Tamil homelands into carved up fiefdoms for various unlanded sons, and then made one of them a king over them. His idea was to let those three siblings, Srichand, Roji, and Tunga, take care of each other. With how many kids Afsin has, he simply can't be there for all of them, so they'll have to be there for each other. Sadly, it seems like letting a bunch of toddlers take care of a sickly infant was a poor choice, given Tunga died a sickly infant almost immediately after his land grant. Afsin was, perhaps, a bit sheltered for a noble and didn't realize his children could die so quickly. From there, he continued the campaigns into the Deccan, which was divided between a couple Maratha kings, as well as taking the Burmese valley along the Irrawaddy River. After Burma, Afsin went on a campaign for the island across the Palk Strait, Lanka. Despite his bad experience with his other infant son, he granted the Lanka Sultanate to his son Ananta. Why he preferred his own children so much over other lords is often attributed to an inflated sense of family justice. It was clear that Afsin was still living in the shadow of his father's accomplishments, looking to outdo him at every corner, even if that meant appointing a literal zero-year-old to be a sultan. The conquest around India continued, and while waiting for a few truces to expire, Afsin focused in on the western half of the empire. His policy of granting the western half of the empire to the Mongol Caliph seemed to be doing fine. The approval of the Caliph was certainly useful for Afsin, although most people knew that the Caliph himself, a Borjigin, was a bit of a foreigner to the Muslim world who conquered his way to his position. From the ashes of the Ilkhanate, the Seljuk family was scrambling to reclaim their illustrious place as masters of Iran. Throughout their history, the Seljuks and Mughals had been friends at best, and ambivalent towards each other at worst, but now that the Mughals have swept up the old core of the Seljuk realm, those pretenses of friendship are gone. First off, the little tendrils of Seljuk land into the Mughal Empire have to go, if only to make the borders look nicer. Why do I even cover the wars anymore? We all know how it'll go. Once the Mughals absolutely crushed the Seljuks, the land was given out to the Caliph as previously agreed, and now the borders look much nicer. The ensuing years involved some relatively savage ambition from Afsin, who would, rather than wait for truces to run out, simply murder the kings with whom he'd signed truces. Even the Georgians weren't safe, given that Afsin had the ambition to reclaim the Ilkhanate title as well as the Persian Empire. Although certainly not as famous, the Ilkhanate was still a way to legitimize himself as a Mongol descendant. Despite the Mongol collapse, their impact was still meaningful for both his subjects and outsiders. In 1302, the Seljuks had been sufficiently weakened such that Afsin was able to usurp the title of Khorasan, and thus ended the Seljuk realm. Leftover vassals then either swore their fealty or had their realms taken by force, allowing Afsin to declare himself Shahanshah of Persia. This was one title which his father did not have that he now has. In reality, it was the Mongol Caliphate that ruled over Persia. They simply paid homage to Afsin, allowing him to call himself Shahanshah. With one more war against the Georgians, Afsin was able to declare himself Khagan of the Ilkhanid as well. Another title for the list. At this point, Afsin's royal proclamations were getting pretty long. Every announcement went something along the lines of Padishah Afsin Tomurtasholu Gurkhani, Padishah of the Mughal Empire, Bengal and the Deccan, Shahanshah of Persia, Khagan of the Ilkhanate, and Protector of Islam, Sultan from the Bay of Bengal to the Black Sea and all bodies of water between them, the Steward of the Five Rivers and of the Ganges, the Restorer of the Caliphate, the Warrior Emperor, descendant of Tamerlane and Genghis Khan, the first of his name. For all intents and purposes, this would usually be shortened to Padishah Afsin Gurkhani of the Mughal Empire. There was one title missing from his collection though, Chakravartin. 
He had not yet conquered all of India, nor were his conquests considered enough to let him legitimately claim the name of the wheel-turning emperor. With one last conquest, Afsin did in fact rule over the entirety of India. Could he really call himself Chakravartin though? Was it not his father who conquered India in reality? These questions of self-doubt left him unable to really claim the title. He was 63 now, and yet somehow it felt like everything he had done was for naught. Afsin knew from the beginning that he would never live up to his father's name, but something in him told him that once he ruled all of India he'd feel satisfied. He was not. Maybe it was because he knew his father did more than him, or because he'd already claimed a couple titles. What's one more, right? Maybe it would be better to leave Chakravartin to one of his sons. Looking at his progeny, most of them were still relatively young, but Afsin chose one of his youngest, Farzan. He had the strength of character and diplomatic touch that would be necessary to keep a realm like this together. While the conquest continued, they slowed down around this time, and many people would note the loss of spirit in Afsin. It seems he'd had enough, and spent his time with Farzan preparing him for the world ahead. Maybe Timurtash's laid-back attitude came from some kind of wisdom Afsin was yet to find. Maybe Timurtash's laid-back attitude came from some kind of wisdom Afsin was yet to find. Maybe it came from different priorities, but he was beginning to understand now. That's enough navel-gazing for now though, as a more important issue has come up. The Caliph died, and his realm has been split amongst his children. The new Caliph was a 14-year-old witch, which quite frankly was pretty unacceptable. Even though the Caliphate was already pretty illegitimate, this was the last straw. Afsin decided to strip the Mongol boy of his titles, and once again, Islam was without a Caliph. Afsin wanted to take the spot of Caliph, but he wasn't exactly loved by the ulema for his obviously secular slant. Nonetheless, he needed someone new to rule over the West for him, so he simply appointed an unlanded Urdu lord to take control. He split the western lands between some of the Mongol kids and his newly appointed Urdu lord with the hope that they'd spend more time plotting against each other than against him. This would be Afsin's last action as Padishah, where he passed away at the age of 70, leaving this world behind. Maybe the answer he'd need for his crisis of ambition could be answered when he went to meet his father in the afterlife. He left the peacock throne to his favorite son, Farzan. The succession should be stable, given his immaculate diplomacy and his placated siblings, most of whom have their own realms to manage. Farzan is, in many ways, a reflection of his father. In many ways, that's why he was chosen to be heir. Farzan didn't really know his father since he'd been busy, although on the very tail end of Afsin's life, the two began to connect. The real question was whether or not Farzan would be able to escape the mental anguishes of his own father's inferiority. In order to be free of that, he sought a closer connection to God. Despite being educated in diplomacy, Farzan pursued a theological focus for his life. One of his first actions upon ascending the throne was to go on a hajj to Mecca. Despite his youth, he felt it urgent to get it done before he became too old and ill to do so. His trip made him consider the various religions around his realm. He'd inherited the realm at a time of great Muslim conversion, which much of the religious establishment used as a way to justify Islam's superiority. In reality, everyone knew the reason the heathens of India were converting was under threat of being second-class citizens. So, thought Farzan, is there any reason that Islam ought to be his religion of choice? If God exists, and all men worship him in one way or another, then could there be truth to the other ways of worship? Although he kept those questions to himself, Farzan started a great project to build mosques around his domain for the purpose of discussion and in search for the truth. These actions, of course, earned him much favor with the ulema, who were not aware of Farzan's somewhat wavering faith. As part of his exploration of other religions came explorations of languages and cultures, since he wanted to read holy books and discuss with religious leaders in their native languages. One of the people he interacted with was the Christian king of Egypt, who had been introduced to Farzan by Muslim refugees from the realm. He was curious about the Christians, whose religion was not all that different from his own, but whose enmity was nonetheless guaranteed. They had some discussions, but it seemed that Josselin, the Outremer Malik, was relatively honest about his disinterest in discussing religion. All he had to say was some hand wave about aspiring to emulate the Lord Christ, his God. He was a worldly man, and Farzan took this to be a little bit insulting. He was upset that such a powerful man could get away with a life without thought. It seems Josselin didn't even understand the nature of the discussion, let alone provide satisfying answers. Was he jealous of the Malik? In many ways, yes. Ignorant bliss was a luxury only available to those who had not tasted knowledge, and Farzan was a gourmand. He returned home, dissatisfied but tenacious about his desire to understand the nature of God. On a somewhat normal, yet boring day, Farzan took a trip out of Delhi to visit the various rivers under his stewardship. Something interesting happened when he visited the Ganges, though. What was normally a relatively boring day turned into a radically life-changing moment for the Padishah. While surveying the river, he found the washed-up, bloated corpses of what looked to be Rajput warriors. Their famously intricate armor and weaponry was missing leaving the noble Mughal rivals of decades past as mere people alike any. Which of these men were noble and which weren't? Who could know? Most likely, the equipment of these soldiers was stripped away, either by locals or by the army that defeated them. Farzan considered his own station in life. What is he without his entourage and silken clothes? What is he without the ambitions of those that came before him? He looked into the dead eyes of the bloated corpses. Was this really the righteous path, he thought? When he came home from his trip, he made an announcement to the court, which absolutely shook the realm. 
He told his messengers and counselors that from here on he was a Hindu and that the realm was expected to join him in this conversion. He said that the atrocities committed against the subjects of his realm could only be rectified with a price beyond the mortal realm. If Islam is righteous and I have abandoned it, then let the fires of hell take me, he declared with conviction. If Islam is a great work of deception, then let it be known that I have saved every soul here from eternal damnation, but that no matter the truth of the afterlife, no Hindu will face worldly pain under the pretense of jihad again. If any subject of mine should question my intentions, let him seek Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, or Mahadevi. Let him seek Allah and find his answer. And if a consensus can be made, let that be the answer. Of course, Farzan was a wise man. He knew that no consensus would be had. All the Hindus of the realm would say that his conversion was righteous, while every Muslim would say it was wrong. In fact, in the coming days, many Muslims of the realm came out as Hindus. Were they false converts from the past, feeling comfortable with the new order? The motivation was unimportant because what was proven with those conversions was that his conversion was righteous, even without a consensus. Indeed, no lord called him on his bluff, and Hinduism became the new religion of Farzan's empire. By removing himself from the control of the ulema and becoming something of a new spiritual head, he had the legitimacy to call himself the true Chakravartin of India. It turns out that a true wheel-turning emperor is the one with no earthly force above him. Unfortunately, the area we call India was only what remained of the Deccan and Bengal empire as far as the legal regions were drawn. This was a little confusing for Farzan, who presumed that India referred to the whole subcontinent, but he was happy to be the Chakravartin regardless. His next step was to ensure that his realm wouldn't split at the seams over this religious schism, so he created a new faith, based on Hinduism, with huge borrowings from Islam, the ultimate compromise, which he called the deen i Allahi. This is based on the real-life religious creation of Akbar, which was more of a moral philosophy followed by Akbar himself and some of his friends. It literally means religion of God, and was based on monotheistic principles from Islam in real life. In the game, I based it more on Hinduism only because a lot of the cool interactions in India require you to be an Eastern religion. Anyway, now Farzan is the head of his new religion, which is a syncretized form of Hinduism alongside Islam. Truly is this the most Hindustani combination possible. Sorry Six, but this takes place before the creation of your religion. This new syncretizing and genuine unification of India created a new culture centered on the mixture between classical Hinduism, represented by Tamils, and the now entrenched Urdu culture, which was called Tohidi, meaning oneness of God. This is in reference to the mass adoption of the monotheistic Dini Allahi across the peninsula, which unified many of the disparate cultures of the region via their appreciation for the worship of one god. Beyond that, Farzan, now drunk with divine power, started to do some strange things. He began to speak in the third person and to lord himself over everyone else. He talked about what it truly means to emulate God. Some might say he had been corrupted by his seeking of religious knowledge. Maybe he saw himself as a god, or an emissary of God. Perhaps he felt he was the next prophet, a huge no-no to his Muslim subjects. Most people just assumed that the Padishah was being boisterous to show off for the realm, but Farzan wasn't joking around. On a whim, he revoked a tract of land from the Borjigans in Transoxiana and suddenly moved the entire court there. He then babbled something about Nirvana and at that moment became a Tibetan Buddhist, after leaving his previous station as head of the Dini Allahi. His eye was twitching with the insanity of a man possessed, as if he were a different person. The entire realm became Buddhist in a somewhat confused manner. But at this point, most people were just going along with whatever their Padishah said. After the ceremony, Farzan declared himself the Padishah of a new realm, a realm called Bactria. Needless to say, this raised some eyebrows. Was he not already the Chakravartin? Was he not the Shahanshah? What does he mean he's the Emperor of Bactria? One of the record keepers in the new capital of Debussia blew the dust off of a tome and found that Bactria was some kind of classical era realm ruled by one of Alexander the Great's generals. What was the realm to do? If the Padishah says it, it must be, right? Farzan, in fact, abandoned the title Chakravartin of India, Shahan Shah of Persia, and Khagan of the Ilkhanate just to call himself the Emperor of Bactria. In a way, it was beautiful to combine all of those realms into one, but it was confusing for sure. The next thing Farzan did was actually quite logical. Of all the things to raise eyebrows, this was not one of them. Farzan changed his name to Iskandar, which is another form of Alexander. Suddenly, the strange change to Bactria and the megalomaniacal behavior made sense. It must be that Farzan, now called Iskandar, was possessed by the soul of Alexander the Great. Iskandar also converted back to the Dini Allahi and returned to being the head of the religion. Although a time of great achievement, in a way, the past year of events were anxiety-inducing to the average Mughal, Indian, Bactrian, whatever, subject. Remembering his old discussion mate, Josselin, Iskandar called for a great purification of the fledgling Egyptian kingdom. This was something of a combination of personal dislike and actual military opportunity since Egypt was a pretty rich part of the world. As expected, even all of Christendom couldn't defend Egypt from the Bactrian forces, and with ease, Egypt and the holy cities fell. Iskandar granted the pharaohship of Egypt to his son, Nairaman, just because he didn't really know who else to give it to. Next up, in order to connect his lands, Iskandar conquered Arabia from the Shia Caliphate 
murdered the caliph with whom he had a truce, and then conquered Yemen. Things almost seemed back to normal. The army was conquering and the realm was expanding. New lords were being appointed, and most people breathed a sigh of relief. In many wars, war was preferable to the wild roller coaster ride of realm swapping, religion founding, and capital moving. Yet there was no escape from the need for Iskandar to swap the realm around. In 1349, Iskandar changed his realm's name over to something new. He chose a name in his native Shaz Turkic, borrowing from his other languages. His new realm, stretching from the Mediterranean to the Bay of Bengal, was called the Damarash Ulus, which was a Turkic corruption of the Damarashtra and the word Ulus, meaning nation. The Damarashtra is a collection of ancient Sanskrit legal texts, and the name of the nation could be compared to the Dane law, as in a nation where the Damarashtra is the rule of law. From here, the history is unknown. Would the realm stand on its own? Would it not? No one knows but the people in the realm. Famously, upon renaming his realm, Iskandar wrote in his journal the inspiration for the name change. My realm is beyond a tax system, or an agreement between lord and liege. My realm is not just some way to amass power, no. My realm represents the bulwark between civilization and barbarism. Between the light of God, which I represent, and the darkness of his shadow, which my towering figure casts. On any whose land which I turn my back, that their people might feel my light willingly. For my light is truth and justice. I so name my land Damarashulus, where people live rightly, by God, for God, and under my protection. It was surprisingly cogent given his behavior, but perhaps Iskandar wasn't some crazy man, but rather a man who genuinely had ascended beyond anyone before him. Maybe his talk with Josselin imparted a stronger impression than he ever thought. Iskandar was emulating God, in his mind. With wealth beyond measure, and an army the size of the entire populations of its rival realms, the once nascent Mughal realm has grown far beyond its roots. The life of Babur laid the foundation for many sultans, padishahs, emperors, and one Chakravartin. The year is 1349, and the center of the world is the Peacock Throne, whose glory has surpassed even that of the Romans. Will the realm last? Most likely not, since no empire stays forever. One day, the empire will crumble, as they always do, and the statues of Iskandar will be nothing more than monuments from days past. For the near and perhaps even long-term future, though, the newly christened Damarashulus will bring in an era of prosperity and stability under the watchful eye of its long line of scholar kings. Stepping out of the story a bit, I hope you enjoyed this final conclusion to the Mughal Empire story. I took some liberties this episode with some of the storytelling, and if you enjoyed that, do let me know. It's a great opportunity to flex some writing skills, but I know it may not be of interest to the community so much when the writing deviates so strongly from the actual minute-to-minute -minute gameplay. Beyond that, I'm going to be posting the save file in my Discord for anyone to download, so if you want to give the file a look or anything, and maybe just enjoy the absolutely brokenly powerful realm, check it out. Also, if you have questions, the YouTube comments are fine, but I'll get back to you on Discord pretty much immediately compared to within a few days via comments, so up to you. Thank you for your time.